The life in the city happens in the spaces that the developers left behind. Um, they're in the laneways and the nooks and the crannies and that's where the life grew out. And the things that were developed while they house the majority of the people and that's where everyone works, they create, um, they take up a lot of space. And what the public squares generally do is create space. They don't take up space, which of course they do, in, 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 but it's a feeling of spaciousness. And that's why people go. It's a feeling of, okay, now I'm not bombarded here. There is that sense of respite. Public squares in their architecture are generally lower. Um, they generally are less than four stories. And so anything less than four stories, um, a person on the ground can connect with the person at the top floor of that. It's a still in speaking context. Above that, you lose that connection. And, and therefore, you know, and you look in the great spaces in the world, in Plata Mayor, in Madrid, in, in the French Quarter, in New Orleans, it's just so many places. If the height restriction is capped at four stories, it's a, it's a much different feel to the rest of the city. Um, and that's where people go and linger and want to spend time and eat and um, gather and etc. So there are plenty of um, great examples of how the architecture of public squares changes the feel of a city. And so should the light do that. think about lighting for public spaces, um, it's quite a different um, type of expression in that in, in by comparison for a commercial project like a, a building or a hotel lobby or a stadium, etc., um, you, you have an owner and you have a developer and you have a builder and um, that is generally true for public spaces, but the expression is, is largely reversed. So it needs to express for, um, for the community, for the many. Um, whereas on, on those projects I mentioned earlier, that was more about um, how um, an individual or corporate citizen wishes to express to the community. And the public space lighting is meant to express for the community. So it is meant to be like a portal to create a voice, a, a, an opportunity or a platform for the community to speak. Um, and so much of our city, to me, feels like... Um, kind of like exploitation and opportunity. So there's people coming to the city and I want to grab them and tell them something and then they'll buy something. And so it's like this exploitation and opportunity mindset is very transactional. And what I see the future as is more relational. So it's about being and belonging, not exploitation and opportunity. It's, it's more about this is your city come be here, you belong here. And that in turn creates lots of the same commercial outcomes that everyone's seeking who, who are building businesses and high rises in the city. Um, it just feels markedly different. So as opposed to, I have something to say, I'm gonna tell it to you, you're gonna like it and then you're gonna buy something from me. That's one way. The other is, I've got something to say, I'm interested to hear what you have to say, and then maybe we have a shared narrative. We have a sh something that we could share um, uh, as, as a means of relating. That creates a very different feel in the city. Um, so uh, it's an interesting development and the public squares of the future, in my view anyway, uh, their success will rest on their ability to transition back to something that is more relational, that that encourages people to linger 
beyond scheduling events for them to attend, more for them to linger on their own time. I wanted to speak about the phrase public engagement and break it down to just engagement. We get asked to do this a lot, to make works that engage people. What do I mean by engagement? And what I mean specifically is there are two axes to engagement, a vertical and a horizontal. The horizontal, let's start with that, any engagement what must have an element of expansion. So you get the idea that for, for you it is an evolution. It is a building of your awareness, of your consciousness, of your mind, of your heart. All of that. So you can sense that in anything you have. In your meal, in your work, in your family, in your relationships. That begins a sense of engagement that signifies that you have the possibility of engagement. The vertical plane is connection. If you don't have a connection to, uh, to the purpose of that expansion, it's a bit meaningless. So that means engagement. That encapsulates engagement. When we talk about art, that art must have a purpose. It can't just be art. It can be, but then it's not engaging or it's not meaningful. So that's how I define engagement. It is expansion combined with connection. Um, so there are many technical considerations I would think about before suggesting putting a screen or a video display or a, an image-based light into a public space. Um, I would consider the where do people see it from primarily, what's the viewing distance from that space. I think of the scale and how big the piece needs to be to speak for the space and for the community. And so the scale, the viewing distance, what's the shape of the space, what buildings are around it, how will people experience it, that's where I begin. Um, and then I think, well, what, what's it for? What would it say? And then I start, to, that, that determines what type of content uh, we would consider making um, for the piece and, what, um, and how we would encourage the community to make content. So should it be interactive? Should the work be generative? Should it be based on the weather or the movement of the people or the sound or, um, or the context, the historical context of it? What, what should we consider about that? In an outdoor space, when you're considering a daylight um, application, the main issue, which is a, the second part of the consideration we have, um, is contrast. So every image needs black. All light needs some black or else you don't know it's light. <laughs> so the image based needs contrast. It needs some black in the image. And so the, in the day the sun colors the black elements of the LED screen structure and makes them gray. So that reduces the contrast of the image and decreases the legibility of it. So you don't see the images clearly because the contrast has been reduced. You know, lighting a street or a public park or something and the idea is that light spreads on a sort of 140 degree angle sometimes. It's just lighting everywhere. So the street light's lighting the street, and it's lighting the pavement, it's lighting this, this guy's front yard and that guy's front yard and, and everybody's like bloody hell it's a lot of light and so the um, 
a simple metal shroud put on that fixture to put to control the beam of light onto the street where it's needed and not onto these people's front yards or these people's properties um, that's a, that is such a simple solution to begin to um, uh, control the light of our cities, to, to put the light where we want it and not where we don't. It's not just about the light, it's about um, well, it is. It's all about light and shade, but that light and shade comes in the form of creating shelter, creating shade, creating uh, microclimate control. How do you attend to the, the heat of this country, which is uh, significant when you're de developing a, a square that is open and you're trying to keep the flow moving uh, and, and allow people to linger there. If it's too hot, they won't. So we're looking at um, quite a lot of um, different misting systems that, that, that contribute to a feeling of, of restfulness and respite um, in the new public squares of our city. One public square I'd like to discuss is uh, one we've been involved in called Yegan Square in Perth. Um, this has several different elements of it. Um, it has a low resolution canopy that interacts with uh, the public's movement um, and that's a double sided canopy and it also has a higher resolution cylinder um, that is seen here uh, it, which is on, on top of that is a what we call the reed screen which is uh, 14 different reeds that represent the 14 different uh, indigenous tribes from this area. The high resolution screen serves to show various um, ambient landscape moving content that is shot on the country of the indigenous people with those people. Um, this is very slow moving one hour pieces that fill this space and change the rhythm of the city. Um, whether it's uh, an old woman's hands or reeds or the ocean, or you see uh, bushfires and different aspects of the country that is Western Australia. Um, these are expressions of that country seen now in an urban context. Um, we did all of this content very purposefully so it moves slowly through the space um, and people can sense a different cadence, a different rhythm when we get to the city. Um, and then this canopy is in the shape of an ancient lake that was here before the city was even conceived or built. Um, and this canopy is double sided so that it has an expression below and also to the buildings above it. Um, so it's lit both sides and it has color and movement and silhouetted images of black swans and, and different um, river shapes as it, as it traverses across the land. So this interacts with any people who walk under it. They can see their movement generating the ripples in this space. So these are examples of how we use high resolution and low resolution. So now that we've discussed lighting public spaces and bringing uh, or encouraging a communal interest and engagement with public space um, through the use of light, um, there are a few things you can do to build your understanding and your intelligence and, and your awareness of when you see that and when you don't. When you go out to your cities, pay attention. Pay attention. See the light. See where it's polluting the space. See where it's leaving the space alone. Find the light and shade in your city. Is, when is that purposeful? When is it not? Find that. When you start to see that, when you start to understand it, you'll get a sense of how public spaces need to be lit to encourage community connection and deep engagement. 
when you go out to your city, you'll see video screens everywhere. You'll see them in the back seats of the cars, you'll see them on the sides of buildings, you'll see TVs and videos everywhere. Pay attention, notice them. How are they being used now? Do you like them? Do those screens speak for you? Do they provide your story? Do they provide an insight into your experience? And if they don't, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to develop an awareness as to where they are? And maybe you will design a public space with a screen that speaks for who you are and speaks for your family and your community. This is what our public spaces need. So if you think of yourself designing a public space or taking a public space and shaping it with light, these screens are just deliverers of light. And the narrative they use to deliver their light um, needs to be inclusive, not exclusive. So consider that when you walk around your city. Where is it inclusive? Where is it exclusive? And don't be discouraged. Most of what you find is exclusive. But this course is the beginning of the, your awareness of how to design for inclusion, to design for connection, to design for collaboration and uh, community engagement.